Good eyes. Morning. Oh, I know. I know you want out. I know. I know. So exciting. You need me some eggs? I wake up at 4.30 because I currently don't have a vehicle. I have to be ready for the bus by 5.50. I let them out, collect their eggs from the little duck pen area, mark them with the date, and get ready for work. Oh, one of my old bosses, he had ducks. I thought they were gorgeous. And I mean, they're fairly easy to take care of. And now that they just reached maturity for the last two weeks, I've gotten uh, you know, an egg a day each from my two ladies. But you never have to buy eggs again. It costs very, very little to feed them. Get in, guys. Come on. Oh, no. Oh, no. Hey, be nice, Daryl. Come on, guys. Mostly trimming, harvesting work. It's always paying. It's always hiring. Somebody's always cutting down plants. Oh, nice. The trimmer essentially comes in when the harvest is ready to come down. And I'll go into the room and we'll cut it down and we make it pretty for the shelf. Cut off all the leaves that you don't want to smoke. And those will get processed into fruit, you know, other products. The ability to zone out and sit in a chair and do repetitive work all day with, I don't know, it's kind of zen because nobody bothers you. You can put in a pair of headphones and eight hours later you go home. I don't think it's difficult, but it is real work. Most people come to play with pot, and it's like, well, this, this is a real job. It's a real business. This is how I pay my rent and how I eat every day. And, you know, you actually have to show up and do, you have to work hard. It's, it is, it's labor intensive. I mean, after eight hours, your, your neck hurts, your back hurts. You got hand cramps, just like, you know, just like a hairdresser. Kind of similar problems that they have after doing hair for years. Their hands start to just, you know. You definitely have all those injuries, the repetitive motion, you know. I don't really do too much to prevent it. I'm just kind of accepting of like, well, this is what I've chosen to do. But I mean, of course, there's all sorts of like stretches and things like you do have to get up like every, you know, you have your break every two hours, of course. But, you know, you get up, you know, and sometimes I'll be standing for a few minutes to trim, you know, that kind of just helps relieve the pain and it kind of just loosens everything up and then you get right back to it. It's a lot better than working anything else that I've done for, you know, it's, it's not that great of money. It could be better. It used to be. It's a lot less stressful. Nobody's breathing down my neck because we just show up and they, we know what's expected of us. We do the job and that's it. There's no micromanaging necessary. If you can't do the job, I mean, you pretty much go home. It's, it's not, nobody should have to, I can teach you how to do it in 20 minutes. This is how I need it to look make everything look like that and I'll see you at the end of the day and you should get quicker hour by hour if you've even never done it they'll sit in here for hours all day if I let them it's kind of their little they drink out of it they'll swim in it they'll bathe I mean I throw their little treats in here because they put their food in the water anyway they kind of wet everything they eat so I keep a bowl of food next to their water dish inside and they you know I'd love to have a bigger pool for them but it's their recreation. They love it. Come on, girls. Yeah. Yummy. And they will just shred that right down to the green part. Oh, she's coming over. She wants some. <laughs> I know. Yummy, huh? Hey, boo. Boo has to come out and say hello. Bare minimum is a pound a day dry weight. And that's equivalent because it might be a wet trim, but you have an estimate like, you know, well, it's going to lose 75, 80% of its weight or whatever, you know. And, but most companies now require two, but one pound is the dead minimum. Like you just, you know, if you can't cut that, then you, you don't work for us. But on average, we expect at least two pounds a day under optimal conditions. 
and most people I work with on the crews, they can do two to three. It's, I mean, if, if you've been doing it for more than a couple of days straight, you should be up to speed with everybody else. It's, it's not difficult. It's, it's the simplest little task. And it's, like I said, you just put in your headphones, you sit down and, you know, your first half hour, you're kind of slow and we expect that out of everyone, like when you first get to work. But then you just get in your zone and you just, just buzz away. The powdery mildew, it's, it's an environmental thing. It can be controlled, but it's very hard to. I see it everywhere. It's just a matter of how much I see. I mean, we do have, at some points, we do walk out of jobs and tell them we, we can't finish this because you need to take care of it. It's that bad. You see a little bit of it on everything, and then you just, you just cut the powdery mildew out. If it's, not, if it's not bad enough to where it's affecting the entire plant, you can chop away the affected part and just throw it away, and you can salvage the rest. Not often the case, though. Usually, when you see it, then it's kind of like, you know, it's like breaking the seal after you've had one beer and you go to the restroom. It's like, oh, wow, oh, now it's, oh, oh. And then you start breathing it and you, your throat's itchy and the headache and your skin gets itchy and red bumps and, you know, you pretty much have to go home and take off all your clothes and shower and make sure you shampoo your hair out perfectly. And just have to really just scrub it off and, you know, you recover, but it's, the breathing issues are pretty constant and they, they linger for quite a while. I've seen people have to go to the hospital for it, depending, like if you have asthma or something like that, oh, it's probably not the good, it's probably not a good career choice. I mean, just the smell of the plants in general, some of the strains alone will just, they'll just mess with your breathing. Like, I won't, you know, you'll want to throw up sometimes because it's just so intense. There's always the risk of like, whatever people are using for pesticides and whatnot, but ever since things have started changing a lot recently where they're getting regulated more about what they can and can't use. I often have at times like I just did a harvest at another client and before I walked into the grow room the grower stopped me he's like just want you to know we don't use any of this this or this. He's like this is what we use. He was explaining to me that you know he wanted to make sure that I was aware how safe they were to make sure that we wouldn't be affected because I literally had to you know you got to pull your hair back and tie everything up and go in and literally reach through the forest of trees and pull things down and it's unless I'm wearing a complete suit where it covers every inch of my skin it's going to get all over me and if there is anything that's on those plants that aren't supposed to be it's going to affect me. A lot of times they just need to add air circulation. I mean I, I don't often see what they do like we aren't involved a lot with the actual growing process or what they do day to day but I mean they'll a lot of times if they've had an issue in the past they're like yeah we've done this, this, or this to correct it and it's getting better and you know if it's a multiple, if it's a repeat client like I can say oh yeah okay well compared to last time it's actually pretty good this time. Pretty much if you think that bud's super frosty you gotta kinda take a closer look and if you rub it with your fingers and it comes off like flour it's, it's the powdery mildew. It kinda looks a lot like somebody went into the room with a firecracker and a bag of flour sometimes and it's just everywhere. I mean, it wipes off. I've seen people like spray their plants down with peroxide and water before we get them. It kind of, it helps a little bit, but it doesn't do, it doesn't do it. I mean, you pretty much, if you have a problem, you have to stop. You have to completely gut your room, scrub it from top to bottom, you know, start over. That's the only way to get rid of it is to just start over. And oftentimes from seed, which takes even longer and most people don't want to do that. I mean, it's, it's money, like, you know, you're, at, you're about to harvest and you notice the problem and then the, the owner of the grow is going to look at it and be like, well, can, 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 you, can you save it? And, well, we'll do what we can, but there comes a point where even on our paycheck is like, well, it's, it's not worth it because now I'm responsible. Like, I don't know, like, what if they got sued for selling a bad product? Is it going to come back on me too because I knowingly put that product on the shelf? So at some point we, we have to stand up, no. We, 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 can't, we can't do this, we got, we got to leave. And it has been that way before. We, we will leave if it's that bad. Like I'll look at it and you know, at first, if I'm not the supervisor on the crew, I'll go to my supervisor and be like, hey, you need to take a look at this. If they think it's just as bad, they'll go and find the owner or the grower and they'll, we'll, we'll straight up, what do you want us to do with this? Do you want us to shred it for the trash? What do you want us to do? I mean, if it's something like that, we might just throw on a mask and we'll just shred it for the trash because it's still some hours to work, but if it's that bad and they aren't accepting their, 
faults, we, I, you know, I or the other crew will just, we have to, you know, call our home office of sorts and explain the situation. We have to leave. I'm sorry. You know, we, we, we can't work with this. It's a risk. I mean, we can't put the employee's health at risk for this. For someone with a compromised immune system or any problem that they have in general, I mean, it's, it's medical. It's a medical product. If you ingest that and you have a compromised immune system, it can cause a whole slew of issues. I can't even, you know, think of anything like breathing problems as well. You know, the, the headaches, like I said, the skin irritations, depending on a person's personal, you know, health, it could really, it could set something worse in motion. Like the one guy that had gone to a hospital, you know, he fell to the ground and started having seizures because he couldn't breathe and things were happening because the powdery mildew was so bad. Working with that person, basically, they, they stayed in the hospital for two weeks. I mean, I don't know exactly everything that happened to him after the fact, but the doctors did say that it was related to the working conditions. And then he wasn't able to work for a little while. He did come back to work, but he refused to work certain clients anymore. It's the same thing, like I, I wouldn't work for certain clients in this industry because after three years of visiting them at random, nothing has changed. It's like they're, they're concerned with profit most of the time. I would like to see people accept the fact that, hey, we grew a crappy product this time. Darn, I guess we have to get rid of it. I'd like to see people not sell it anymore because most of the average consumer walking in doesn't know what it is and they just see this product and, oh, that looks like extra crystals and they, they'll sell it because they, you know, they think people are stupid and you know, people just aren't educated about it. Most of the time, like, a lot of the growers, you know, they may have a base salary, but they're bonused on weight. So the grower oftentimes is the one who's going to make the decision because if he doesn't sell that product, he, you know, he didn't get his, you know, one and a half, two pounds of light. And then he's not going to get his paycheck that he's supposed to get. He's going to get his base salary and nothing more. So we're told, you know, and they just, they'll put it out on the shelf and they'll sell it. Sometimes it'll get marked down. It won't be a $40 eighth. Maybe they'll sell it for 25 they're still selling it for way too much. I mean, everything has a price, and you know, it, if it's priced appropriately, there's things you can do with it, but I wouldn't recommend it. I would just straight up show them, like, look at this, dude, you, you, I can't believe you're selling this. Like, you, you can't sell this. It's, we, we need to throw this away. And if, if they argue and refuse to do something about the issue, that's the point where I'll walk out. Like, I can't at that point. It's, because it's my conscience. If I sell that product to you, because I have a compromised immune system, I have to think about, I don't know who's gonna get that product. I mean, whether it's somebody medical, knowledgeable, somebody that's looking at it and can inspect it before they buy it and know what to look for, or if it's the Joe off the street from Nebraska that came here for vacation, they went to their local pot shop because they can buy pot in Colorado, they're gonna buy that, smoke it, not knowing what's up, and then they're gonna have their issues and they won't know why. We definitely don't know the long-term effects of anything yet. We don't, we don't know. I mean, this is, this is still a fairly new industry. 20 years from now, we joke that like, people that work in coal mines and whatnot, you know, they got the black lung. Like, we're, they're going to call it trimmer lung. We joke like it's going to be called trimmer lung because of all the chemicals and powdery mildew, bugs, anything that you can think of. We just don't know. There's no research. There's no data. There's no long-term study yet. There's nothing to back up. We, we know what it can potentially do, we just, we don't have proof yet. Until somebody dies, until somebody has such a severe issue where it forces a change, there's, there's not much, not much we can do. Hopefully we'll find a few today though. It's kind of got to scoop it around. It's, they like to hide them. If I hear somebody on the crew call out that, oh, this one's got PM, it's just, there's a groan amongst the entire, like, ah. Oh. And then we look at it and it's like, oh, well, it's not that bad. I can cut that part of the butt off. You know, I can get rid of that. Or upon further inspection, like, you have to start breaking the buds apart. You know, you have to destroy a couple to, like, find out how bad it is. And sometimes it is just a touch, you know, and like, okay, that's manageable. I mean, because we are realistic. Like, even with all the problems, it's, you still, you still have to do your job, you know, so I do what I can. I just put the date on, 
They're good for about 30 days on the counter. You don't even have to wash them. This one I'm gonna have to like wipe off though with a dry cloth. As long as I don't use any moisture, it won't wipe off the bloom, which protects it. And you can leave it on the counter or I can wash it completely. And then you just have to put it in your fridge and it's still good for quite a while. And that's my collection from this week so far. My girls have gotten big. You're from Colombia? That's cool, man. I bet you know where to get some yay. Have you smoked Colombian gold before? Sometimes I hear joking related questions when people learn where I'm from. My country is known for certain cannabis strains and narco trafficking. America's drug war is being fought in my country, creating violence and other social problems since the early 1970s. In the past few years, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and even Uruguay have legalized cannabis for recreational medical purposes. Realizing the benefits of legalization, President Santos signed a decree legalizing the growth and selling of cannabis for medical purposes in Colombia in December 2015. The war on drugs in Colombia contributes to violence among cartel members, exploitation of rural farmers, murder among gang-involved youth, and unrest in overpacked prisons. Colorado and 15 other countries decriminalized cannabis because voters supported adult use of cannabis and recognized cannabis as medicine. Related health benefits include treatment for epilepsy, Asperger's, PTSD, and muscle pain relief. Evidence is beginning to show in areas where adult use of cannabis is legal, decreases of smuggling, violence, and arrests. Millions of dollars in cannabis-related taxes have been raised that goes back into the public's use. If Colombia follows the successful legalization models of pro-cannabis countries, it may see the reduction of narco-trafficking and violence that comes with it. Fewer people will be locked up for nonviolent drug charges and more Colombians will have access to affordable alternative medicine. The legalization and decriminalization of cannabis in my country will help to end stereotypical images of Latinos as drug dealers. When I tell people that I'm from Colombia, I want them to comment on how it ranks as the second most biodiverse country in the world and how it is Latin America's oldest democracy. Do not ask me if I know where to get some exotic buds or cocaine. Instead, congratulate me for legalized Colombia. As a 14-year-old from a twice-broken home, I was an unstoppable force. In high school, I hung out with the wrong crowd and was suspended for consuming cannabis during PE. My middle school mandated that I attend Lake Area Recovery Center in Ohio, an outpatient drug rehab facility. It didn't help anything. With one failed drug test after another, the school made me persona non grata. Eventually, the local judge and my parents decided it was time I ended up living with my father in Erie, Pennsylvania. Once I arrived, I wasn't sure how things would go. My dad had a bum knee. After five surgeries, he was unable to manage his pain with synthetic drugs, so he turned to cannabis. Cannabis was my drug of choice for anxiety and stress, but I wasn't just a casual user. I grew my own cannabis. The five foot tall plants in my basement were more than medicine. They provided the resinous glue that brought my dad and I closer. Together we tended the seedlings, watered the plants, and processed the buds for smoking. Who needs a family therapist when you can grow your own cannabis plants as a social activity? Our relationship was flowering like the cannabis buds that were growing beneath our feet. My dad and I got closer working around pot plants. Sneaking out of the house and hanging out with my rebellious friends was no longer appealing anymore. Eventually, the University of Colorado Denver awarded me with distinction, a bachelor's degree in history. Also, I'm a member of the Honor Society and received cum laude at my university. These accomplishments were made possible only with support from my dad. He saw through the thick cloud of pot smoke my potential. My dad pushed me to join the Air Force and encouraged me to go to college and to be the best father and stoner I could be.
My mom is a strong-willed woman in her early 60s. Open a dictionary and turn to the word glue. You'll see a picture of my mom. She keeps our family together. My mom has an open door policy. I can drop by for any reason just to have some tea or eat lunch. Holidays are the best days in mom's kitchen. The aromas of Zeresh Polo and Adas Polo make me want to eat everything the minute I step inside. In winter 2015, my mom was involved in a car accident in Denver. Daily, she struggles with chronic pain due to her injuries. The cortisone injected by doctors worked for a little while. Surgery is a last resort option. It breaks my heart to see her deal with extreme pain in her back and neck. Her day begins by waking up with pain and staying in bed trying to find comfort until late afternoon. Heating pads are pressed against her body with little or no effect. Ibuprofen barely helps and gives her stomach aches. As I rearrange her pillow, she tells me that she can't lift her arms over her head. The pain in her upper body is simply too much. My mom used to take English and psychology classes at Community College of Denver, but she stopped so she can focus on trying to manage her pain. In May 2016, I'm taking a course called Cannabis Culture at CU Denver. The other day, students and I went on a field trip to a grow house in Boulder. After the field trip, I visited the adjacent dispensary and purchased a cannabis salve. Cannabis salve is a topical ointment used for deep muscle relief. It is a hybrid and contains 14.2 mg of THC, 8.6 mg of THCA, and 7.5 mg of CBD. Brooke, the grower and owner of the facility, mentioned that she started this grow house just because of the salve. She was talking about how great of a product it was and how she made it for her father-in-law. Brooke was in the process of making it, and it healed her psoriasis. Seeing it was such a miracle drug for her, I figured I would buy it for my mom. It was an impulse purchase, and I didn't think that the salve would reduce my mom's pain. When I returned home, I told her about the cannabis-infused salve. She has always been anti-drugs, and it didn't surprise me that she was uninterested to use the cannabis on her body. Several hours later, my mom was experiencing pain in bed. She said, I replied, Without talking, she pointed to the area on her back where she felt pain. I applied it. Within minutes, she got out of the bed and said, Dardish ser shod. Standing upright, she lifted up her arms. I couldn't help but smile. A few minutes later, my mom and I are drinking cardamom and saffron black tea in the kitchen downstairs. She tells me, Hich vach faramush nemi konam khubiyato. I moved to Colorado six years ago from what was supposed to be a one-year exchange program. Living with some family friends during my stay and enjoying the opportunity of getting to know so many different cultures, little did I know the violence due to drug cartels in my hometown in Chihuahua, Mexico, would increase heavily while I was abroad. Before the end of my year abroad, my parents let me know that the violent situation back home was getting dangerous. They encouraged me to return back to Colorado the following year. I never saw or had any of the horrible crimes and violence happening at that time to my family or me. Unlike a friend's neighbor who was shot outside his house because the drug dealers thought he was someone else. Danger was everywhere. At the mall, coffee shop, and pretty much any place, anytime. My parents wanted me to go to Colorado because my school at home had an exchange program in Golden. In Colorado, I finished high school and I'm finishing college. During my stay in Colorado, I was exposed to cannabis, which is a taboo at home. In my culture, a person is considered a drug addict just for smoking a joint. 
Last winter, I was home for the holidays and one of my friend's mom approached me and asked me, Billy, I've heard that many kids here are starting to smoke marijuana and I'm a little concerned about my younger kids. Since you live in Colorado where it's legal, could you tell me how people are about this? Are they really pushy for other kids to try it? Is it dangerous? I thought what she said was hilarious. I understand that many people are concerned about the involvement due to cannabis and drug cartels. In Argentina, Australia, Canada, Belgium, and a number of U.S. states, people are trying to understand and be more open-minded about this crop. The stereotypes are still there, but I believe the legalization of cannabis would be good for my culture. It has medical uses and may create other wellness and job opportunities for different people. In Colorado, I'm enrolled in the course at CU Denver called Cannabis Culture to better understand cannabis as medicine. I want to share this new knowledge with my family. When I told my grandma about this class, she thought I was crazy. She said, what? A marijuana class? Are you crazy? I can't believe we're paying for this. I want to learn more about this subject and I want to be informed when I'm trying to explain to my friends and family about the benefits of cannabis. Some of my family members might find it useful for medical reasons. I come from a culture where cannabis is frowned upon because it's associated with extreme violence and corruption in Mexico. We should normalize cannabis as medicine and help to end drug trafficking. 